Hey, Fearless community. I just want to thank you for listening to Fearless Tips and Talks. I am passionate about helping people overcome fear and anxiety, so much so that I wrote a book about overcoming severe panic and anxiety disorder called Nervous Breakthrough. You can find it on Amazon or you can order a signed copy with a personal message from me at fearlessunite.com forward slash books. And then you click the Fearless Store button. All of this will be linked in the show notes. Enjoy this episode. Welcome to Resilience in the Pews, a pivotal podcast series that dives deep into the intersection of faith, mental health, and the challenges faced within the sacred walls of our churches. Well, hello, Fearless family. We are in the Resilience in the Pews podcast series, and today's episode is called God is Good. I hope you're ready to laugh and maybe cry even some happy tears because that's exactly what happened when I read my guest today's book, Life is Good. Or no, I'm sorry. Life is hard. God is good. Let's dance. So here's the thing, friends. I wanted to formally introduce you to him so you could hear all the amazing things that he's accomplished. But something just told me he'd rather skip the formal introductions and just be introduced simple. (laughs) So I looked at his Instagram bio and it reads, I write books. I work for Cure and I do radio. So Brant Anson, welcome to the Fearless Tips and Talks podcast. I am honored to be here. I appreciate what you do. Thanks, Brant. Okay, so we met uh, through our mutual friend, Lance Ford. And friends, I, I do encourage you to go back and listen to Talk 29 with Lance. It was a very powerful interview. But okay, so your book here, Life is Hard, God is Good, Let's Dance. It's really coming at the perfect time in this series. And mainly it's because you know, these topics are heavy. The mm-hmm. stuff that these people have been through is is just really hard, right? And so as I was reading your book, I, you know, I laughed and I cried and I literally wanted to like jump for joy because so many of the stories that you share throughout this book are just so beautiful, so beautiful. And so as I was like reflecting back on all the chapters, I just see this like common theme that keeps coming up. Keep it simple keep it fun. And a walk with Jesus doesn't have to be so suffocating and religious. And so something that is totally not suffocating in the way that you do things is you draw these doodles, right? You you have these doodles inside of your book. And I got like the best laugh out of this one doodle. It was towards the end of the book. And <laughs> It was this woman sitting in the pews and she she was contemplating on if she should um, tithe her Kohl's cash, if she should tithe her Kohl's cash. And I just thought, oh, Lord, like this is so funny, so simple, so humorous. And so clearly you're not afraid to keep things simple and 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 to not take yourself too seriously either. So my first question for you, Brent, is how do you think Christian's commitment to religion and man-made rules or even traditions gets in the way of sharing the simple truth of Jesus? Well, we love complexifying things, I think. I mean, I think because it's like this, when I when I want to write a book, sometimes I'll start collecting books about writing books, and then I'll read them because you feel like you're doing something by studying the thing. Yeah. You're not actually doing the thing. Mm. The thing in this case is we're supposed to follow Jesus, do the things he told us to do. Okay. That's the thing. For some reason, we've made it into this. I can't, I don't even know. I don't know what this is. Like a lot of the stuff that we do. uh, And it confused me for the longest time because you can, you start making this list of like, okay, Christians, I know it's all about evangelism. That's what we're supposed to do. We're all supposed to evangelize all the time. All of us. Okay. And that's the real point. Also reading the Bible. So evangelism, reading the Bible, and then obviously praying. So just three things, praying, reading the Bible, also serving in my church, maybe short-term as missions trip. Oh yeah. I need to tithe as well. Maybe work at the soup kitchen, maybe be on the newcomers cookie ministry or whatever. I was supposed to, and then also my neighbor, and then I was supposed to raise, but you can make a list that goes 500 things long. And it's very overwhelming. It's anxiety producing. It's, 
the beauty of the simplistic, what God's looking for, what real spirituality is, is loyalty. That's it. He's looking for our loyalty. But I didn't, I didn't know that growing up. And um, I now understand it and how beautifully simple that is. He's looking to partner with us in life. He's always been looking for that with Adam and Eve, with Abraham, his family. Like, uh, so my thing now is uh, in the morning, I walk the dog and it's my reminder when I take out our, our golden retriever, Cozy. Like now I talk to God about today. Like, what, what resources do I need for today? What are my daily bread? So I'm an introvert, so I ask for social energy. I ask for content for my radio show. But whatever I need today, and I let God handle other stuff, whatever happens with my career or whatever next week, next year, I have no idea. Um, but it is a more simple approach, and I do see it bearing a lot more fruit, and I think I'm a different person. And I'm paying attention to him more. Like, and what you pay attention to determines everything. Mm -hmm. It de determines who you're becoming. So, yeah, there's a very long-winded answer to a pretty simple question. I also want to acknowledge something off the bat here, because if somebody's watching on video, they're going to start to freak out when they see that my book shelf actually has folds and waves in it. This is a cheap curtain I got to block the trash can back there. So... There's a big you reveal. Fooled me. You fooled me. That looks excellent. Holy cow. Thanks. It's $11 if you want to get one. And uh, very nice, classy looking, I think. So, I mean, you can use you can use digital Zoom backgrounds, but I'm like, I don't want fake, fake backgrounds. I want real fake backgrounds that are analog, old school fake. So... Anyhow. Oh, Lordy, yeah. Lordy. That was fantastic. Thanks. Okay. So you haven't always known to keep it simple, right? So you grew up as a PK. And for those that don't know, that's a pastor's kid. Yeah. And so you allude in your book that you have experienced some harm inside the four walls of the church. So how have those experiences shaped you and how have they made you a different Christian because of those experiences? They have completely shaped me. So this is growing up, my brother and I, my dad's a pastor, very fundamental, rural churches. I think we moved 17 times before I graduated high school. Really? In different houses, like in different towns and different. So, uh, you know, I love him, but I did write about it in one of my books called Blessed Are the Misfits, which is about this sort of thing. Um, it was rank hypocrisy and we were terrified in our own home. Mm. Terrified. We thought we were going to die. I didn't want to go home. It was violent at times uh, towards my mom. It was very scary. And my dad's a big guy and it, with a, with a big voice, and he's talented. And he's smart. I guess he's handsome and stuff. So women, he was involved. I don't know. I don't know all this stuff. It's, but my brother and I were terrified. They finally got divorced and my mom just wanted to make it work. So they got married again and then divorced again. But he, you know, I, it was three sermons a week and people saying, wow, your dad's such an awesome man of God because he's good on stage. So that has shaped me. You can imagine. I'm extraordinarily skeptical about wow. everything. Uh, so not only that, I am not impressed by people on stage. Mm. I'm not a big sermon guy. I will listen to some, you know, I, but I just, I'll give them. People want me to talk. I'll talk. But it's not my preferred way to learn. And uh, I just feel like, okay, here's another big show. One of the ways this has been a blessing, though, in my life has been, so I'm on the radio. We were talking about this before we started recording. I do a radio show on Christian radio stations that is apparently, quote, unquote, very successful. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not smooth. And I'm, I don't want to ever hear myself say something that I don't really mean. It's made me really allergic to that. But yeah. the beauty of that has been... That's actually what people want to hear on the radio. They don't want smooth. They don't want, well, some people want polish or just religious 
flowery terms or whatever thrown around. I just can't do it. I just don't want to do it. So I think there's a genuineness, I hope, that permeates the show where people are like, oh, my goodness, finally. Uh, I think that really has helped me. And when you read, like, life is hard, God is good, let's dance, I'm not talking about, hey, just put on a happy face. No matter what's happening, who cares? You know, buck up, buckaroo. It's not that. It's actually not about naivete. It's not about not knowing what's going on in the world. You can be totally aware of what's going on, including religious hypocrisy in the extreme, but still be at peace and still be joyful. Because it's not, you don't, you don't, it's not lack of knowledge. You actually know more about the kingdom and how good the kingdom actually is. So this is why I write tons of stories, which I think is what you're referring to in this book about my travels to cure hospitals. These are surgical hospitals for kids that have correctable disabilities around the world. Permanent surge, like do an orthopedic neuro plastic surgery for kids who have nothing. And they've been considered cursed their whole lives. And it's all done in the name of Jesus. Well, I vibe with that, you know, and then like seeing surgeons and the techs and nurses praying over the kids when they're on the tables and seeing kids be able to run and jump for the first time in their lives. And seeing people pay for that because they're believers in Jesus. They're like, hey, let's heal the sick and proclaim the kingdom. Yeah. Okay. It's 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 so refreshing to me. It's like, this looks like Jesus to me. Yeah. And it's so beautiful that I want to say to people, and I, it's impossible, so I try to tell the stories. But, like, if you're down about American Christian expression, which I get, or the goofy industries that we make out of Jesus' name— I'd love for you to see one of these hospitals. Mm. This is still the work of the church. And in fact, you know, the hospitals are 98% staffed by locals, not Westerners. We've, we've trained all the, all the neurosurgeons in our Uganda hospital are, are Ugandans. We've trained them. They're the only neurosurgeons like in that area of Africa, but they're all believers. Mm. And same thing with Kenya. No, there are no Westerners on that giant staff at our Kenya hospital. It's all Kenyans. They're believers too. Like if you're going to say, well, Christians are this way or that, you're talking about my brothers and sisters in these hospitals too. I don't think so. Mm. You're just paying attention to pop American stuff. I get it. I live through it. I still see it. We're a swim in it, but it, a swim isn't even a word, but you know what I mean? And I think that's cool. And I think it should catch on. We're a <laughs> <You> swim. <too. laughs> We're totally a swim in this, but this isn't the whole world. This isn't the kingdom. And if you see the kingdom, people actually doing the Jesus stuff, it's like an advanced trailer of heaven. Mm -hmm. See people healed? Like, and then they're told they're cursed their entire lives because they have some kind of disability that they've done something wrong or their mo the moms are blamed. So these desperate moms come in the door of our hospital. And instead of running away screaming that she's cursed, let's get away, we run toward her. And say, your baby's beautiful. How old is she? Yeah. What a handsome boy you have. She, they've, she's never heard that before. But this is an expression of Jesus. It just, I'm like, people should know about that. As disillusioned as we get, you should know that, that Jesus is still using his people to actually do some Jesus-shaped stuff. And that's why your book has been so healing for me, because it is a stark difference from yes. what I've been healing from and, and talking about and, and from what you were sharing. And so as I hear you tell your story about your dad and your mom, and, and I imagine the way that you saw women being treated even were probably, you know, and so I have to just share a story in, in the book. You, you talk about these three remarkable women who played for the university of Oklahoma and, and they were on a softball team and they had just won their 53rd game in a row and like third consecutive national championship, I think. So because of their success, right. They get to be on ESPN and, and, and the reporter asked this like riveting question and, and our fearless community will, will resonate with this. But she asks, how do you keep the joy for so long when anxiety seems like a thing that could ease very easily set in? And I'll let you guys read Brandt's book so you can see how the girls like responded to this, or you could Google it on YouTube and see it too. But 
the way these girls answered this was so powerful. And I'm telling you, these three young women took America to church with their answer. And, and they they proclaimed the good news of Jesus to all who were watching. And 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 like, Brand, I just have to tell you, I, I honestly, I cried. I yeah, cried I during this part of the book because- <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, you can actually watch that on YouTube. If you like, you like just look up Oklahoma softball players. Yeah, Please, press- I'll link it in the show notes, actually. I'll link it in the notes. But like they, they preached that Jesus saves. They preached that Jesus was the hope of the world, not softball. And, and, and so in many Christian denominations, women are taught that they can't use their voice inside the church. And, um, and if they can, it's for women and youth only. And I just, and that's caused me so much confusion, Brant, so much harm, so much pain and fear. And it just feels incongruent to the father's heart to me. And 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 I just think about how he trusted these three amazing young women to make a huge impact for his kingdom for millions and millions of people watching, including men. And then you end the story by saying this quote, you say, sometimes Wisdom wears a softball uniform. And I just thought, oh, it, it, you know, there you are keeping it simple again. So I don't know. I just can't help but wonder, like, doesn't our churches need this type of boldness, this type of wisdom? And I don't know. How how would you respond to all of that? Well, it just it hurts. Like, uh, like you're saying, I think people are disenfranchised for a lot of reasons. It might be because they're women or it might just be the way we set things up where we have a some person on a stage in a theater setting like and that's our idea of church like that alone precludes a lot of gifting that people have who are sitting there looking at the backs of other people's heads like and think that the job is these are these professionals like we made that up right i mean that's not that's not biblical it's and it's not it's not anti-biblical necessarily either it's not like i'm saying this is you can't do this but it's based on the greek theater I mean, there were orators in Greece on the street that were busking, basically, but they tell stories and eventually they'd flip a hat upside down and people could throw in some money if they were good at it. And eventually they'd do like Branson, Missouri, where they get their own shop on the highway. You know, they get their own little theater and they would tell stories inside their theater using a pulpit, which is a Greek idea. There's no pulpit in the Bible, you know, but it's a Greek theater thing. And people would sit there and if they did a good job, they would pass the plate at the end and people would throw in their money based on how the oration was. Well, that's okay. But the the church is so much (laughs) more wild and wonderful and beautiful than that. And if that's your only perception, well, that's, that's hard to stick with that, isn't it? Like, so I do talk about that in the book, the idea of deconstructing Mm. and I'm sympathetic to it. Because I've done that in my own life. Now, my own skepticism has chased me back around to Jesus because he's the only one I know of actually accommodates, actually acknowledges human brokenness and then does something about it. Mm. Like his his description of all of us thinking that we're good people and we're actually not fits squarely with cognitive science now. Like we are so beset with cognitive biases about how awesome we are. Everybody is. We're all better than average morally. We're all good people. And he is the antidote for this self-righteousness. So when I read him, and I think about all the garbage I've been through, or maybe all the garbage you've been through, he's like this respite. Mm. Like you read him. Who's the first Christian missionary? It's a woman with a bad reputation who leaves that well and goes back into her town and says, could this be the Messiah? And people listen to her and they want to meet Jesus and um, he hangs out with them for a few days. Like he is like escaping to him and then seeing his work actually in the, in the real world has made me not deconstruct like that. And what I want to tell people is, look, having gone through what I've gone through, I could easily be a, a militant atheist. Um, however, however, the kingdom is too good to leave. Once you see it, like Jesus is saying, the kingdom is breaking through now. And what he does, what he, he, he does is he heals people. See? So their idea in the, in the Jewish mindset of the kingdom, that's like Isaiah. The lame will leap like deer. The deaf will hear. Eyes will be open. There's going to be healing. 
And he's like, look, it's breaking through now. Heals. 75, 78% of his miracles are healing miracles. It's not random. He's showing the kingdom is breaking through now. It's an advanced trailer of heaven. So when we heal, this is what I get to see at these hospitals, why I tell these stories. Like we're participating in that kingdom breaking through. It's so beautiful. I'm not leaving that. Yeah. When these people write their manifestos of, you know, I'm leaving the faith. I was a big star and I was a big preacher or artist or whatever. I'm like, it's weird because I'll read those manifestos on Instagram or whatever. They don't mention Jesus. Huh. They don't mention the kingdom, which is Jesus' favorite topic. And I'm like, why were you in this? I don't mean that as a put down. It's like, literally, if it's for the Christian movies and stuff, that's not good enough. I mean, uh, the T-shirts, the what, what do you, I'm in this for Jesus and I'm in this for the kingdom. But if it's not for that, I'd leave too. But he's too good. I don't, I don't want to abandon this. Now that, I, now that I've seen how he actually operates and how his way of life is so genius to help us be healthier and flourish. Like, no, I, I'm not leaving this. And, and I'm not going to allow hypocrites in my life. I'm not going to give them the power to stop me from the best relationship of my entire life. Mm. The one actual source of peace in the world. I'm not going to allow them to stop me from having that conversation with God every morning and trusting in him and having peace, a sense of well-being regardless of circumstances. So, yeah, that's my little riff. Sorry if I got carried away there, but that's, I mean, I really want people to hear that stuff because a lot of people don't think about it. I wonder as you were deconstructing, um, it sounds like I've got to read some more books from you too, uh, that I'm going to need to link in the show notes for other people, but I, I can't help but wonder how the cure came into your life and how that actually brought a cure to you on just sort of, um, reconnecting you to the heart of the kingdom. Is that, is that a fair statement? I think it is. I've even said that, like, I need this to be what it is. Mm. And like, I've told people within, within the, the network that like, if this is a fake thing, if this is just a money operation, another cult of personality or blah, 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 that's going to be, I'll be crestfallen. I'll be struck in the heart. And I, I feel like I know it backward and forward, having visited all these hospitals and been a part of the organization for long enough that we, my wife and I give more than we ever thought. We just funnel all our money, mm. not all of it, but a lot. Like, I totally believe in it. It's a bargain. It's like a thousand bucks to pay for a kid's surgery. That's unheard of. There's a, I wish I could have put this in the book just last week. I want to tell you this because this is so sweet. There's a, a girl in Zambia named Siba Genie, and she's like 15. And she's had bilateral cleft palate her entire life, like and cleft lip. So you'll just see if you see her photo, she's got like a, a tooth sticking out directly under her nose, like sticking directly out of her face. She's been considered a monster and a freak her entire life. Not only that, her name means I never saw my father. He died before she was born. And her mom passed away when she was three. So here's a girl that has lived as an orphan and a just a rejected, isolated person her entire life has been defined by this. So she's in her town. This is very recently. It's not the capital of Lusaka. I can't remember what the name of the town is. The presidential motorcade, the president of Zambia was passing through the town and the whole town gathered along the street. And she's in the mix with everybody else pressed against the street. And they're watching this big thing with motorcycles going by and then the limos and stuff. And one of the limos pulls over because a guy had seen her and, it, and he's with the government, but he said, I know of a hospital. And he told her sister about this as well as her, where I think they can heal you. So he made the plans to get her to the hospital. She just had her surgery. Dr. Meredith did the surgery, our plastic surgeon, uh, who's a brilliant surgeon and a mom. She did this, this reconstructive surgery. I saw the after photo. <laughs> She's beautiful. Oh. She is. And her name meant, my, I never saw my father. And it's like, 
somehow your your heavenly father saw you like he's the god who sees you like hagar says in the Bible, like hagar this forgotten woman mm. and here's this young woman like this we did 18,000 surgeries last year like that and it's all done in the name of jesus to say it's not your fault nobody did anything wrong it's so that god could be glorified and now you're healed yeah, yeah. so if this is a big fraud, I, I'm done. I just, I don't, but it hasn't been. That's just it. It's not. It's not. And the stories of these people going back to their villages and people freak out. They're like, we thought you were cursed. What? Who did this? Uh, so, yeah, I'm, that, it has been a help to me. It has been medicinal to me to witness that. I just had like this vision, you know, like in the early church when people were just getting healed left and right. And, yeah. you know thousands of people like i just imagine them going back to their towns like modern yes. day right now being healed and it's like just it, blowing up like and 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 as americans we are missing out on that like we are yeah. genuinely missing out on the power of jesus by by being so i don't know if it's theatrical or, or i don't know what it is but like you tell these stories and i want more of jesus you know right. more of him right. That's how I feel about it too. I mean, that's, but that's the sweet thing about actually seeing his kingdom in action. We actually do the stuff. Yeah. So compelling and beautiful. But he told us to, he sent out his disciples to, to proclaim the kingdom and heal the sick. And he even said, you'll do greater things than me, which I that's was right. Wondering. That's too weird. Like, how will we do greater things? Well, look at the numbers because we're doing his thing. Here's the other weird thing that's wonderful the arguments that I never hear among cure staff at the hospitals or or in America or wherever. All the internecine battles about doctrine this, that other thing. What, we don't have time for it. It's just being shoulder to shoulder in mission. And you visit one of these hospitals, you walk into like a children's ward, you're going to hear harmonies because there's moms who break out in song together in the children's wars because they're so happy that their kids are being healed. And you can imagine that. I'm not, I'm not kidding. Like the, it's the best, it's the most worshipful place places I've ever been. And I don't, I don't you know, normally get emotional about worship services at all. I'm just, I'm always kind of like, okay. Mm. And, uh, but man, that I've been in a surgery, a neurosurgeon was finishing the, uh, the, CTV procedures for a kid, a baby with hydrocephalus who will die without this procedure. He's finishing it, listening and singing along with worship music in the OR. Oh, and I'm sitting there. I'm just standing there like trying not to cry. I'm, I'm backing off towards the back wall. Like good grief. This is the best worship service I've ever seen ever. Hey friends, I just wanted to take a moment to interrupt to let you know that the Fearless Tips and Talks podcast is part of a ministry called Fearless Unite. Our mission is to help you find freedom from fear and anxiety in a world that feeds it. We are rolling out a new initiative called Soul Shepherd, which is a mental health advocacy movement in our community. We are very serious about decreasing the mental health crisis that we are facing. And we're going to do this first by starting with teenage girls, one body, soul, and spirit at a time. If you want to learn more about our Soul Shepherd initiative, go to fearlessunite.com forward slash soul shepherd. This will also be linked in our show notes. Now back to the interview. You know, Brant, and you might've already been answering this as we're talking, but you talk about how it's cringy to try to make Jesus cool. And I just, can you expound upon that a little bit? Well, I think you can, you could probably expound on it pretty easily. Like, I just feel like when we try to be cool and hip and relevant and blah, 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 it winds up, winds up looking dumb. I don't think that's, I think, yeah, that's just been my experience. Uh, especially in a hyper-marketed, hyper-consumerist society that we live in where everything is turned into a market thing mm. and people see right through it. And I know there's, there's some people that they're like, we just need to brand Christianity better. And I'm like, we need to stop branding everything. Mm. Um, because the whole world is branded. Like 
I know, I know we need logos and stuff. I'm not, I'm not just saying it's all to throw it all away. I just mean like there's a, there's a genuineness to being uncool. That's very compelling. I even tell the story being in the Niger hospital on Thursdays, we have a dance party and it's the kids that are in different levels of healing. Right. So you might have 16 year old girls and eight year old boys and three year olds, you know, wheelchairs or canes, or maybe they can dance or maybe you have to hold them, but they turn up the dance music. It's a blast. It's so much fun because a, it's a picture of the kingdom, right? Cause you got, sometimes the doctors are in there, like everybody's dancing, but B, nobody's trying to be cool. Mm. There's nothing like a party where nobody's trying to be cool. I feel <sighs> like, I feel like it's really compelling, right? When everybody stops yes. trying to be cool, now we're having fun. Now that's, now we're talking. So the sooner we can get to that, the better. I but feel you like. know what else I hear and I see, and I have vision of while you're speaking, this is the doctors are partying with the patients yeah. and there's no, there's no hierarchy. Like no. everybody is just like t- the body together working and no part is, it sounds like the nurse is just as important as the doctor or the worship lady. You know what I'm saying? Like, it sounds oh, like yeah, you guys absolutely. all are just. So think about how remarkable this is. So at lunch, for instance, well, they, these people have come from hundreds of miles away. Sometimes they have no money. Mm-hmm. They spent their their life savings or whatever whatever pennies they have to get there on a one way trip on a bus or something, or they walked to get their kids. You're, I mean, if you're a mom, you're that desperate to find healing for your kid, right? Absolutely. They have nowhere to go, so we we have hostels now at the hospital and at the hospitals, and they're also able to like eat. We we serve them food and everything, which is not what they're used to. But now they're sitting at picnic tables for lunch with the surgeons and the nurses and housekeeping and other moms and other patients while the kids are playing around the siblings. So in a normal hospital environment, it's so hierarchical. If, mm. if a hospital may be the most hierarchical institution imaginable because you've, you, you think housekeeping down here and then we'll work our way up to somebody working in the cafeteria and the nurses are of certain kind of RNs to doctors to no, 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 surgeons, no, brain surgeons. Like this is all, everybody at the same table. Like, it, it, all right, now this is church to me. Like, uh, beautiful. all right, I, I get this. I get it. I'm in for that. That sounds mm-hmm. like, uh, again, it, it, the kingdom is this advanced trailer of heaven. When we see it, it gives us goosebumps. I made this video the other day and I've, I almost apologized for, I did apologize for showing it to a group, but it made my point. I just got video. I made a five minute video. It was just people getting their colorblind glasses. I don't yeah. know if you've seen this. So they put the glasses on and they could see colors for the first time. Oh, I haven't. The, what they do, there's, there's one like where the kids are giving their teacher, he's a, a younger guy, a teacher. He's just sitting there in a chair and he tries on the glasses, instantly bursts into tears and takes the glasses off. And he's just crying because he can't believe the colors. And then there's a family that gives them to an older guy who's a dad. And they array like colorful balloons in front of him. They give him these glasses. He immediately takes the glasses off and starts crying. Like he can't, there's a boy. Then there's a woman I put in this video. She's hearing music for the first time. And they they put cochlear implants in and turned them on. And there was this soft piano like arpeggio. And she bursts. She looks both directions like, what's happening? And then just bursts into tears, sobbing. And then there's the reunion videos of like soldier comes back and surprises his little daughter in the classroom. And she does a double take and then bursts into tears and <laughs> says, daddy, and jumps in his arms like a completely limp. Like, why? I had to shut it off because everybody's bawling. And I meant, like, okay, that's my point, though. Why do these things make us resonate like this? Well, the kingdom of heaven is all about reunions, likes which you've never seen. It's about hearing music for the first time or music like we've never heard it or having people's eyes open, seeing colors they've never seen. But it's healing. 
Like whenever we see just vestiges of the kingdom, you don't even have to be a Christian. People watching the opening ceremonies on the Olympics, there's a big processional. The nations are at peace at one, as one. Why is this giving me goosebumps? <laughs> I mean, it's to me, it's all a harbinger of what's to come, but it's so beautiful. We long for it. We're yearning for it. It's like we're nostalgic for this place we've never been because we're made for it. And everybody is. Well, I'm, you know, again, I think it's so good. We just don't talk about it enough, but Jesus keeps trying to describe it. He's like, it's like a treasure in a field. Once you see it, you'll give up everything for it. It's that good. Yes. yes. Right? Yes. But we don't talk about it. Even though it's Jesus' favorite topic, it's like you can grow up and never really talk about the kingdom. I don't know why. Mm. Something that I think is so powerful uh, uh, about you and the reason why people probably resonate so much is, is the way that you're able to articulate stories that reflect the kingdom of God. And I have to just share this 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 personal part. Um I I have a nephew who is autistic. And oh Brent, when when I look at him and he smiles and he just views the world I can tell he views the world so differently than I do. And yeah. it's like joy when I'm in his presence. I just, he, I believe he's marked by greatness. I love him so very, very much. And you share in your book that you're on the autistic spectrum as well. Yeah. And I just, I guess I just, I need to hear from you on like, how, how, how has that changed the way you view the world? And then I'm going to ask you about encouraging parents that have autistic children and then also about the church. But let's just start with the question yeah. one. Like, how is how yeah. have you viewed the world differently? Well, I, I do. I, I was diagnosed years ago. So this is way before it was cool. But also, I was still a, I was a young adult. And um, it was a great explanatory device, explanatory device, whatever, for what I went through when I was younger. Mm. I never dated anybody. Um, never had any girlfriends. Well, I did have two dates. I write about that in the book. And yeah, you did. <laughs> unbelievable cringe. <laughs> it's a crazy story. <laughs> it's like, it's like, no way. Um, but yeah, so the way I got married, I was in college. And so I had a friend. We had played games with mutual friends on a missions trip or whatever. And she thought, okay, he's kind of amusing. So we were pals. No romantic anything. And we were studying one night and I stopped studying. We're side by side. You know, she's over there. I'm over here. I stopped and I pivoted towards her and I said, I love you. And she said, uh, thanks. And so that's how, that's the slick way that I turned that corner and so we've been married for 34 years. Oh, I love it. It's going pretty good. And um, so it does make you different. It does give you a different perspective. I heard one doctor, back when they used the term Asperger's for high-functioning autism, when they would make that diagnosis, he he would tell people, like kids that came in, he would make the diagnosis and say, congratulations, you have Asperger's. And I love that. I love it so much. And I feel that way when I meet someone who's on the spectrum, especially if they're teen, even adults. Like, I'm biased, but I feel like we're really interesting. Like, there's there's usually a thing that you can find out what their area of expertise is, and they're off to the races. It could be a 12 year old boy or a 13 year old girl or a 30 year like, but there's a thing that they're really into, and you just have to ask them what their thing is. Bam. And uh. So yeah, there. I, I hope that's encouraging to parents too, because like, uh, you, it does get better over time. You start to pick up how to like. Okay, I have to make eye contact here, and I have to shake hands here in this way, and I need to lighten my visage or something, or not be so blunt all the time. Um, and yeah, and then. Uh, it it just does get better. I think I take the hardest times usually as a teenager and then young adult. What about for churches? For churches that are trying to embrace people and families that have autistic 
family yeah. members. Two things. And I don't want to forget to talk about the emotional quotient, if you can remind me. The emotional what? Quotient, like that's just our emotions and how we relate faith-wise. People okay. Spe- okay. So don't let me forget. But as far as churches go, if I was an enterprising church, meaning I cared deeply about the community, I would offer gatherings for people on the spectrum so fast, especially like middle school kids. Just say we're starting a middle school kids on the spectrum group. Wow. And or high school, you could do high school later or young adults. When we lived near Sacramento, there was a lady, it wasn't a Christian group, but she just wanted to help her son. He was like 20. He's like, we're going to do a get together in the park for people on the spectrum. And we, mm. we saw an ad for it. We showed up because our son was in that pocket. He was a little younger than that. And on the spectrum, we showed up. It was jammed. Wow. With all of these people, all of us, including me, like a little bit socially awkward, but we all know it. And it made it really fun. And pretty soon I was walking around hearing these conversations. One was a detailed, passionate conversation about the paint on the Hindenburg. There I'm you like, have it. these are my people. Like, but I think a church that does that, people will clamor for that because they're desperate for their kids to have some social contacts where they can be loved as they are. You're dying as a parent when you see your kids like getting fooled about thinking they have friends, but they don't really. Mm. But they thought they were our friend. They don't understand. I thought they were my friend, but then they did this to me. Like, I don't understand. Well, they're not your friend. I'm sorry. Like, that's what you have to deal with. Like, but to have a place they can go, people who aren't believers will bring their kids just wow. because you're meeting that need. I don't understand why we wouldn't be the first in line to host these sorts of things and do that. And if it's a matter of learning, we'll learn on the fly, like make it an mm. experiment, try it for a few months, you know, uh, and love these kids. Here's the other thing I would say about church. A big reason a lot of people on the spectrum abandon faith or they're not attracted to it. And there's, that's a lot. I think a lot of them are highly intelligent. Okay. Also, also ask tough questions. And don't relate as emotionally like other people do. Well, churches, I think, are very heavy on emotion. Like creating this emotional thing Mm. and equating that with spirituality. So you're made to feel, and I was made to feel, like if you don't feel God in this place, we can just feel God. as I can't. I can't. I don't. I'm sorry. So I literally thought, what's the matter with me? Wow. Am I such a sinner that God has, I went through this in college. Like, am I such a failure? Because I know I'm a sinner. I'm aware of what I do and think. But other people have these amazing experiences and I don't. So either God's a a lie or he's moved away from me because he's disgusted. Or there's something just wrong with me. And the truth is, Emotions are not spirituality. We keep trying to create emotions. Emotions fine for what they are. Spirituality is loyalty. That's it. So if you don't feel God around, but you still talk to him, now we're talking. Like that's, I'm not getting the emotional reward, but I still invest myself with God. Well, that's called love. I'm not getting an emotional payoff. But I still keep showing up. I try to learn to love my enemies. I try to learn to forgive people. That's that is loyalty, and that's hesed in in the Hebrew, and it's in there like two hundred and seventy times in the Old Testament and New Testament in the in the Greek version of it. Most of the time, it's God's loyalty to us, but often it's about our relationship to Him. Well, if we would explain that to people, a lot of people are analytical. Women and men both are not so given to emotion. But definitely people on the spectrum, this is not about whether you feel God around. Your feelings don't dictate God's existence. Like your feelings can change based on whether you got a nap or whether your team just got robbed by the refs yesterday or like what, whether you ate a dilly bar, you know, 10 minutes ago, like that does not determine God's presence. Wow. So I keep telling people, look at what David does in Psalms, for instance, or, or in Lamentations with Jeremiah. They talk to themselves and say, why is my soul so downcast? Put your trust in God. 
Mm. So you remind yourself of what's true, even if you're depressed, even, even if you remind yourself of what's true and you can have this sense of well-being regardless of circumstances, even while depressed, there's a sense of well-being. I know this from experience. Even if you're grieving, you can have a sense of a deep sense of well-being somehow that transcends everything. I'm curious if you, and it's okay if you don't, but do you have a moment where you remember that it wasn't about emotion and it was about loyalty? Was there a specific thing that God did in your heart where you were like, whoa, this is making sense for me now? I've had weird experiences that, are so weird. I almost don't want to say it. And it's funny though. I did write about this in my, I wrote a book called the men we need. And I was talking about praying. Um, I've had these moments where I'm like, so thankful because I don't, I don't get this big payoff. And when people go on and on, when they're praying, like growing up in church, my mind's adrift. And I suspected everybody's was. And then I go back to Jesus and he's like, when you pray, pray like this. And I'll be darned if that prayer isn't only 23 seconds long. How awesome is that? If you think about it, like that Jesus would be so tender. And he keeps it so simple. But yeah, yeah. There's been a couple of times when I prayed something, even sarcastically, thinking, this is stupid to pray for this. And he, like God, in a sense of humor, came through. And I I just don't want to take the time to tell the stories, but those were not emotion-laden prayers. Those were almost flippant. But God isn't a formula. He's not not a a hocus-pocus, you say the right words, spell thing. It's like he's... uh, has a personality Mm. and I can know what that personality is like from Jesus. And that's very good news Mm. because I like his personality a lot. Yeah. So I didn't really answer your question, but there you go. Yeah, you did. So you end the book since we are a fear and anxiety ministry. I loved that you ended the book talking about stress and how to be less stressed. So I'm just curious, would you just end today with giving us like your top anxiety tips? Sure. Yeah. It is, it's, this isn't pie in the sky stuff. So I, I think with anxiety and stuff, a lot of us can be like, okay, but realistically, I'm still going to be wor- worried and stuff. Like, I think Jesus is realistic. Mm. He says, be like the lilies of the field or the birds of the air. Or when Paul says, don't be anxious for anything. Mm-hmm. We know, like just for, just from modern cognitive science, you know, like gratitude chases out anxiety. We know this. And literally, Paul says, be anxious for nothing. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and then thank him for all he's done. And then the peace that passes our understanding or exceeds our, our experience will guard our hearts in Christ Jesus. But literally, it's a two-step thing. It's like, tell him what you need. Mm. thank him. And then your anxiety level will decrease. It's true. And as we do it as a practice, we become different sorts of people who are, in fact, less anxious over time. So I'm not talking about hitting the magic button, but it's a practice. So the gratitude piece is huge. The other thing, the start of that, like tell him what you need. I heard Tim Ferriss on his audio book. He's like a time management guru guy not coming from a Christian standpoint, but he talked about how he outsources everything to his assistant in India. Mm-hmm. So he would like, he was talking to her one morning. It's like schedule this dental appointment. And also he's like, you know what? I'm really worried about something today. Could you worry about that for me? And he said it as a joke. And she was like, okay. But he said it worked. Like just knowing somebody else was worried for him, he was able to concentrate on the other stuff. And I was like, that is so genius. And it's exactly what we're told to do scripturally. That's right. We're supposed to cast our cares on him because he cares for us. It's literally outsource your worries. Mm. It's a very consistent thing. Tell him what you need and then thank him. Like, so 
that's a brilliant way to live. Like I'm going to outsource this to him because I can't handle tomorrow or next week. Another brilliant thing about what Jesus is saying here, which endocrinologists will, will tell you, there's, there's a book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by the, the primate neuroendocrinologist at Stanford named Robert Sapolsky, who is a militant atheist, by the way. He calls himself that. But he wrote this book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. He's like, look, animals, they're not, they're just thinking like 30 seconds from now. Like a, a lion starts chasing a zebra. All of these physiological things happen. That's fight or flight. That's anxiety. That's stress. Your cortisol level spikes, your adrenal level spikes, your blood pressure changes, your insulin level. Like there's all this stuff, like systems start to shut down. The cortisol increases your appetite for sweets. Uh, it makes you gain weight faster. Like it changes your metabolism. It changes your skin. But he's like, see, all of that stuff that happens for the zebra or any other animal, it's over in 30 seconds. Mm. One way or the other, it's over. But humans, he says, we're the ones who can trigger that and keep that in our system for years. Yeah. Because we'll worry about next week. He's like, zebras aren't thinking about next week, next year, what lion could happen, or maybe a lion could go get my kids or something like, mm -mm. and Jesus himself, a militant atheist concluded by saying, we should be more like the animals because they're not worried about tomorrow. It's not going to add a day to your life. Like what, what good is it? It actually hurts you. And I'm like, yeah, Jesus told us that. Be like the birds of the air. They don't get ulcers. So I, I just, I just think reflecting on his goodness. And lastly, I would, I would say this. Well, capturing your thoughts is important. Like I talked about David and Psalms or, or Jeremiah and Lamentations. But lastly, I would say this. With all the problems I've seen in Christianity, with all the stuff I've gone through, all the garbage, the terror in some cases, I have learned, I can say, don't have all the answers, but I do trust the character of God. So I've learned that he's good. And I'm banking on that. He is so, so good. My team plays tomorrow in the NCAA tournament. And they played years ago. And I got really worked up because they were down 15 points to Arizona in the Elite Eight. This is Illinois where I graduated. Okay. And my little my little boy was sitting watching the game with me. And I was super negative. My wife was there too. Because we're going to lose. We're down 15 with three minutes left. Like, we're going to lose. And it's really disappointing. And the refs have been terrible. And we couldn't catch a break the whole game. And I was complaining and whining. And my wife was like, could you just let him enjoy the game? Like, it's over, though. Well, we came back and won. Hmm. Spectacular inning. So I've watched that game repeatedly on YouTube because it's such a great ending. And uh, I'm like, but I don't get anxious watching the game on YouTube. I don't get mad at the refs. Hmm. Why? Just to know the end of the story. Bam. Right. So I trust, I, I don't have all the answers, but I trust God. Mm. Jesus himself. I think it was, maybe he was winking his eye going like saying, you're going to have troubles, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Like I know how this ends. Wink, wink, nod, nod. I know. And you guys are going to like it. And you're going to have all your questions answered and you're going to be mm. very, so yeah, I'm taking I'm kind of taking that to the bank. I'm gonna take the take it to the bank with you and fearless community. I hope you guys have just felt the joy and peace in this this interview. Hey Brand, how do you feel about uh leading us out with a 23 second prayer? How do you feel about oh, that? I can totally do that. I missed your uh, short prayer. I warn people that all the time. Like I would on. love you to do that. That would be great. <laughs> all right, here we go. Here we go. God, you are so good. Thank you for allowing us to talk about your goodness. Your kingdom is beautiful. Help us to be more and more aware of that and pay attention to it. We pray this together as people are listening now and in the future. We pray it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Boom. Thank Boom. you so much for being here today. Pleasure. It's so fun. 
If you found this to be helpful, will you help us get the word out about this podcast? I would be so honored if you would share it with your loved ones, rate it, review it, and also be sure to subscribe. And lastly, And I really mean this. We want to hear from you. If you have suggestions or ideas on something that I should cover or a tip that you'd really like help on, please send us an email, podcast at fearlessunite.com. Again, that's podcast at fearlessunite.com. Thank you so much for listening.